All right, so Rick, with the midterms rapidly approaching, let's start with a prediction. Let's play the prediction game. All right. Will it be a red, do you think that there'll be a red wave on November 8th? Or will Democrats hold the line with abortion mobilizing turnout? You know, what are the polls telling you? And you know one thing, I don't believe in the polls. Hence right. says who, right? There are many different ways, and we'll talk about it, that I think they should be doing it. But what are you hearing with your ear to the ground? Here's my sense of the, of the race as it stands today on Thursday, the 20th of October. Um, we are in a situation where all the political fundamentals six months ago were for a gigantic Republican sweep. I mean, top to bottom, we were going to lose everything. Inflation, gas prices, all that stuff. Since then, Dobbs and, and abortion have reset the playing field somewhat. Uh, there's an argument being made right now that the Democrats might have peaked a little early. I'm not sure that's the case yet. I still think we're going to end up with a Republican House just based on the redistricting uh, structures around the country and 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 some ground level things in the in the in the congressional races. The Senate right now, I mean, I have to tell you, Michael, our modeling on the Senate is everything from a plus four Democratic uh, win to a plus four Republican win. And it it's the noise is so bad and the signal is so weak that, you know, it's hard to see where that's going to shake out. I do think in Pennsylvania, Fetterman's starting to open it up. Uh, I think in Georgia, it is a crapshoot, and I'm not happy with where that's headed in some of the numbers right now. Um, I think in Arizona, you're going to end up with Kerry Lake as governor and uh, Mark Kelly as senator. That's going to be a split decision out there. Um, but I, I, look, we're we're in a situation where where the idea that you can take your foot off the gas ever is something because there were a lot of my Democratic friends who back in August and September were kind of patting themselves on the back and saying, "Well, we're good, we're set, it's okay." Dobbs saved us. I don't think Dobbs saved them yet. Now. We are going to see record, record, I mean, absolutely smash every record book turnout this year, which is where the numbers get a little weird. It used to be that high, high turnout was great for Democrats, but we saw in Virginia in uh, 19, or in, excuse me, in, uh, yeah, in 19 that, or I'm sorry, 21, it, we saw in Virginia in 21 that record high turnout can also help Republicans. So we may end up with some of this high turnout. Uh, may end up helping people like Carrie Lake, um, and and it may help Herschel Walker. So, Look, so we we have talked about Rick yeah. quite a bit, both on this program, your program, Lincoln Project, yeah. as well as just privately. Yeah. We've talked about what we can do, what we have been doing in order to help to drive turnout, whether it's with the Gen X, Y, Zs, yeah. uh, whether it's just any anyone. Uh, women as a result of the Dobbs decision, and so on. Nevertheless, you know, there are, we'll call them legitimate polling companies, though, again, I hate the entire process. I think the process is stupid when you have a poll of a thousand people, and you're going to base the entire future on a thousand people who you already know how they're going to vote, which was the whole says who bullshit in the first place, which by the way, yep. I would like to just remind people that I was correct about, but there is a company called 538 and you know, they're a, they're a polling company and they have their forecast out for what's going to happen. And they give Democrats a 71% likelihood of keeping the Senate. However, on the same poll, they have 70% or above that the House gets taken over by the GOP. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm very disappointed in even hearing that. And there are cer certain circumstances where the gerrymandering does not permit a Democrat to win. I acknowledge that. That's but right. at the end of the day, we really have to look to see what divides the two parties? What's dividing Republicans and Democrats? Sure. And the answer to that is democracy over economy. And I'm not fully understanding people's rationale when you end up choosing economy, the price of gasoline, for example, versus your democracy. Do these people not see that the loss of Roe 
is just the fucking beginning to how far the Republicans are going to take this. And if, in fact, they take over the House, we all know what's going to happen. You impeach my guy, I'm going to impeach your guy. That's right. They're going to go into the House. I mean, here's a preview for, for MAGA voters first. Everything you... You, you claim you care about inflation, gas prices, all that stuff. They're not going to do a goddamn thing about any of those things. Right. Day one, hour one, minute one, it's going to be investigate Hunter Biden's laptop, impeach Joe Biden, impeach Joe Biden over Afghanistan, impeach Joe Biden over gas prices, impeach Joe Biden. They're going to do nothing but Benghazi over and over and over again. So nothing's going to change for the economic fate of individual Americans if, 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 the, the Republicans take the House. In fact, it's going to get worse. They've already said they're going to crash the government and the economy by doing a debt ceiling freeze. They've already said they're going to they're going to wreck the market and and thus your pensions and four hundred one ks by doing a debt ceiling freeze. They've already said they're going to cut off aid to Ukraine so Putin can win. They've already said that they're going to go and do a national abortion ban. And no matter what you think about abortion, okay, no matter what you think about it. I believe, as a conservative, that the conservative position is to stay the fuck out of people's business. And, and the idea that they're going to do this and, and, and they're going to help anybody economically or they're going to improve lives of Americans in any way whatsoever is bullshit. They're going to go and do a stunt so that they can rev up for the 2024 elections, whether it's Trump or DeSantis or whoever runs or Carrie Lake or whoever it ends up being. They're going to try to make this into a circus for the next two years, destroy the economy because they think that's their path to victory. And, and, and it is going to be a disaster for this country at every conceivable level. Why is it that people then don't understand? You know, the president, unlike, of course, what Trump wanted to be, right. is not the king. You do not have the ability to declare from your throne right. that... I am going to do X, Y, and Z. It's going to turn the economy around. There's, they, do they not understand that the way our founding fathers established this country is that there are three equal and separate right. branches of government that are supposed to work together? You know, we don't have that anymore. There is no working together. Yeah. Right now, Republican versus Democrat has become a zero-sum game. Purely for you to win system. means I. That's right. For you to win, I have to lose. For me to win, you have to lose. That's and right. that's not a that's not a good way in order to grow the country. It's not a good way for us to be in a position where we can do things that actually help the economy, that help the people of America. Instead, it's all about party affiliation, which kind of brings me to this question that I want to ask you because this really. Pisses me the fuck off. You know, you know, I fucking hate Jim Jordan, right? I mean, I think he's just a pompous scumbag. This bullshit of the disrespect. He's the only asshole in the entire house that refuses to put on a fucking jacket like he's back over right. there at Ohio State, right, right? With his wrestling team. But this is what bothers me. Obviously, if the GOP does retake the majority of the house... The madness that's going to come out of it, including the probability that Jim Jordan will end up leading the House Judiciary Committee. I mean, you know, in essence, then what happens is Trump will then have the de facto control over Congress because Jim Jordan, like many, I hate to say it, of these Ohio wrestlers are on their knees to him. Listen. The, the the Republican caucus, when Trump was elected, there were still about, um, I'd say 60% of them when Trump was elected were were uncomfortable with him or outright you know, like opposed. They were, they were the older school conservatives. By 2018, almost all of them were gone. They'd either lost, been primaried, been redistricted, got out of the business. They didn't want to be there for it. The caucus now is very MAGA. When, the, when, when this year ends, when this election year ends, you're going to have a caucus that's even more crazy, that's even more far out there into the, into the ether of conspiracy theories and nut job ideas and election denying. You're going to have a caucus that looks a lot more like Marjorie Taylor Greene than Kevin McCarthy. And, and you know, Michael, the thing that, I, that makes me crazy, I'm sure it makes you crazy too, 
is we both hear these stories of Kevin McCarthy behind closed doors to, saying to big donors like, oh, come on, I need you to help me so I can keep things under control. We can do a tax cut. He has no control. He has lost control completely. There's a really good chance that Jim Jordan says, fuck it, I don't want to be Judiciary Committee chairman. I want to be speaker and yeah. takes it from him. Or Steve Scalise takes it from him because they've gone fully into the dark. They are fully crazy. And, and this, this idea that the, that the caucus is going to have any grownups left is, is, a, is a fantasy. It's going to be the most insane shit people have ever seen. It is going to be the most, it's going to, it's going to be like Fox News isn't crazy enough for them. Tucker Carlson isn't far out enough for them. They're going to be feeding the OAN monster and the Newsmax monster and the, all this other edge case bullshit that's out there now that, that is the right-wing media ecosystem. And, and as they get closer and closer to this election and feel more and more confident, you're seeing the daylight you know, from, from behind the, the shield. You're seeing the reality of what, they, what their campaigns are saying. And they are going to go for the full abortion ban. And they are going to go for the crazy, you know, let's cut Social Security. Let's cut Medicare. Let's cut Medicaid. Let's tax everybody at the, in the lower middle class to pay for another, you know, trillionaire tax cut. Yeah, and look, I want, I want my listeners, and hopefully you'll promote this on and through the oh, LinkedIn yeah, yeah. project, because I believe, I believe that a video, you know, may be necessary. And I, I got I you. I got push, you. On I, do, this. <laughs> I don't even. I don't even want to push the issue that he could become speaker. Right. Let's just stick for a quick second that he could become chair of the judiciary committee. Right. We're talking about bad Jim enough, Jordan. by the way. Right. Which is more than bad enough. We're talking about Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio, who is accused of knowing and doing nothing about serial sexual right. assault on students, on fucking right. children at Ohio mm -hmm. State University when he was the assistant wrestling coach from 87 to 1995. All right. How many stories have we heard now about Ohio State wrestlers who Jordan contacted begging not to come forward with right. this information? So we're going to have chair of the Judiciary Committee who is a sexual abuse right, um, enabler. I mean, it's no different than fucking Matt Gates, who also, I don't understand, hasn't been prosecuted as of yet. I mean, it Blows makes me no sense. Let me Blows go me one away. step further. The potential chairman of the Judiciary Committee is a fucking election denier. He's part Correct. of the big lie. He's part of the insurrection. And yet, did he provide testimony? We see that he's got all sorts of legal issues now with forwarding of texts that he received to Mark Meadows during January 6th and in advance. But yet, that's okay. We're going to make this guy, and I shouldn't say we, I'm talking about voters, right. are going to allow this guy to become the chair of the judiciary? I mean, how uh -huh. does something like that happen? Let me tell you, the, 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 power, of, the power of the madness inside the Republican caucus is what drives it now. Michael, you and I both know there's no more ideology there. There's nothing about the constitution or tax you know, policy or, or strong foreign policy. It's all about how do you feed that monster that, that is the Republican base that Trump like set into motion, that he activated and still makes, you know, he still activates them a lot. He still makes them, you know, the fact that you've got a, uh, this, well, let me let me loop back for one second. The fact that the map of the Senate races looks like it does is all Trump and Trump's base. The Republicans could have easily taken control of the Senate this year. I mean, like walked over taking control of the Senate this year if they had David McCormick in Pennsylvania and David Perdue in Georgia, and they and that and that they had not had and and Jane Timken in Ohio, they would have blown out these races. But Trump's desire to have crazy people like Herschel Walker, um, you know, who, who, who yeah. Herschel Walker is like the, the ultimate sign of like Trump in the 90s being a star fucker. You know, he loved that. He loved the athletic thing. He loved the, 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 the guy. And so, of course, no matter what's wrong with Herschel Walker, Trump loves him. Therefore, Trump's base loves him. 
no matter how hard that makes the election for them. Yeah. Look, let me go one step even further. You know, the Children's Defense Fund, every year they put out report cards on the various different members of Mm -hmm, Congress mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so on. What do you think Jim Jordan got from the C- from the CDF regarding the bills or oh I, I can't imagine or I can't signing imagine he got anything, bills. anything above an F. Well, he did. He got an F. So very yeah. very good. And you know, I want to just read something from their website, Children's Defense Fund. During the 117th Congress, Representative Jordan has taken get your load of this one four votes four that would help the children in his district. His district. Forget about ours, right? His right. district. He's introduced a staggering zero bills, co-sponsored zero bills to help children in general. He's taken 13 actions that CDF believes to be against the interests of children. All right? Now, in furtherance, the report card includes, and this is based off of information on more than 700 bills introduced during the congressional term. All right? Jordan, I mean, four. Four votes that would help children out of 700 plus bills. The guy's a motherfucking pathetic asshole through and through. And yet, somewhere along the line, these people in Ohio, I don't know, maybe they're, I don't know, drinking bad water? like from Camp <laughs> Lejeune or something. You right. see all those commercials going on there. Maybe something something is going on there that I don't know and I can't certainly understand. The guy has done nothing for your children in Ohio, right. all right, other than allow sexual abuse years ago and probably would allow. It. He's an election denier. He's pro the um, abortion, the the um, determination of Dobbs yep. and the and the national ban. What are these people thinking? It, you know, forget about it, it, the men. Uh, uh, Rick, forget about the men. How about the women in the state? How about the young generation that doesn't understand what it's going to be like now because they've lived with and they're going to be the ones who have to contend with it? And then the young women. What about these people? You know, Michael, this is, this is the, the, the dark power of redistricting in America is Jim Jordan is in a seat where Jesus could come back, run as a Democrat, and Jim Jordan would still win that seat. And, 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 and the idea that, that there's any ability to, for, for, for decent candidates to win seats in those places is pretty much an illusion. And that, that is a really dark and sad development because you know he's got a Republican, I think it's like plus 17 or something. It's impossible to win in that seat for a Democrat. So Jim Jordan can be as crazy as he wants because the state legislature drew a map that protected the Republicans. The majority of you know, Republicans control the legislative body. And this is why for Democrats, you know, they often invest tens of millions and hundreds even of millions of dollars into what I call the vanity candidates, okay? So Beto O'Rourke is probably gonna raise like $150 million this year. He's got zero chance of winning. I'm sorry to say, nice guy, cannot win in Texas. Um, but they, they ignore state house races and state Senate races, and they don't do the work at the grassroots because you got to take yeah. over those legislative bodies before you can do redistricting. And every 10 years, the clock starts running. And every 10 years, Democrats fuck it up because they say, OK, we're going to focus on the glamour candidates. I mean, Stacey Abrams in Georgia, I don't know how much she's raised, but I think it's close to $100 million. She's going to lose by 15, 12, 10 points. Who knows? Uh, they don't invest in places where they should be investing. And they and they end up getting these redistricting results every year. And they're like, why can't we fix this? What's wrong? Well, what's wrong is you don't have control of state legislative bodies. Republicans control 30, 31 state houses and state senates and governor's offices in the country completely. So they draw the maps how they're going to draw them. And that gives the Republicans an enormous political advantage in Congress every cycle. And it gives guys like Jim Jordan a free pass. If redistricting was either nonpartisan 
or if the Democrats had a little more juice in the in the legislature there, Jim Jordan would not have a plus 17 seat. He'd have a plus three seat. And then people will go, OK, it's worth me coming out to vote. I'm going to I'm going to stand up against this guy. He's an asshole. And 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 it's it's just a really difficult box that people find themselves in because it's just it, it's it's this structural thing Democrats have not been able to sort out in their heads in the last uh, 30 years. Look, I understand whether, you know, I personally despise the guy because he is an asshole. He's done nothing for Ohio. So I get it. You're a Republican. Mazel to you. I couldn't be fucking happier. Everyone is entitled, as far as I'm concerned, to vote for whoever they want. But why would you vote for somebody who's done absolutely nothing for you, has not made your life any better? In fact, has voted four, four out of 700 bills, plus 700 to do yeah. things that help your children. It's time that you stop thinking about the party and start thinking about the country. And look, if Jim it's Jordan so, yeah. was, if Jim Jordan's name, you know, tomorrow became Tom Jordan, right? right? And he and he was not an election denier. He didn't wasn't involved in the scandal that he actually got out there and voted on behalf of children, you know, sure. in the state of Ohio and his district and so on. I would say, okay, listen. He's a qualified Republican candidate and good for him. He's doing right by his whether or not I I'm, I, I agree with, you know, which party he's with. No problem. I get it. He's hey, done listen, stuff there, that's there, good. there are conservative parts of the country all over there. The, the country's center ish, center right ish. There are plenty of places where where the values of people in the community reflect a Republican belief. And, and, and if you had if you had a guy who wasn't a complete shitbag like that, it would make my job a lot harder at the Lincoln Project because, you know, all of us were Republicans when we started LP, conservatives when we started LP. And, and I'm still a fundamental conservative guy in a lot of ways, but I'm not insane. And I can't be a part of a party that's insane and evil. And, and Jim Jordan represents insane and evil, not Republican. You're exactly right, Michael. It, if he was a, uh, you know, a, a guy who who believed in in even if he was like a George W. Bush Republican, you could still go, okay, that's a conservative place. He's a conservative guy. It makes sense he's elected there. But he's in, he he and a lot of these people, these MAGAs, are conspiratorial, crazy, cruel, idiotic, and just driven by this sort of nihilist sense of like blow everything up. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm like a John Kasich type of Republican, somebody who sure. you know, actually did some really good things. So let me then move on because we can talk about the next shitbag, Kevin McCarthy. You <laughs> recently wrote a <laughs> you recently wrote a piece for the Lincoln Project's website, and it's yep. called "The Three Rules MAGA Republicans Live By," that posited how. Kevin McCarthy is able to hold power. Can you do me a favor? I read it. I thought it was fascinating. But can you unpack for my listeners, you know, um, what you wrote? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, you know, the, 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 the summary of it is, is this. If you're a guy like Kevin, you always have to lead a very double life. You have to pretend that to, behind closed doors and to, to donors and to the media, you have to pretend that you're a normal guy, that you're there to pass tax cuts, that you're there to pass deregulation, you're there to do the things that the, the, the legacy brand of the Republican Party used to do. And more and more, it's hard to have that lie hold up because, you know, he's got Marjorie Taylor Greene at events with him oh. now. He's got, he's got Marjorie Taylor Greene running around saying, well, Kevin's going to make me happy so that I'll keep the base in line. And, and you can see who runs the asylum now. It's people like Green and Boebert and Gates and Jordan and Andy Biggs and all these weirdos and edge cases. So that double life is required because the major donors don't want to be associated with crazy. They don't want to be associated with Marjorie Taylor Green. They don't want to be associated with Matt Gates. Those people are... Are, are completely, you know, anathema to corporate America. But Kevin and Mitch McConnell both need corporate America to keep that checkbook open so they can win these races. Um, I call and, bullshit on that, by the way. 
Let me let me just stop you for one second. I call bullshit on that. Look, when I was involved with Donald, yeah, I, yeah, I was as a Democrat. I was the vice chair of the RNC Finance Committee. Yeah, yeah. Right? Until Steve Wynn, who's truly an amazing guy, he went ahead and um, he forced me to change to the Republican Party. He says, you just, it just, you can't be. And right. you know, we're not letting you leave this group. We raised like $140 million or something like yeah. that in that one fiscal year. Oh, yeah. I call, I call bullshit on the fact that they need this money in order to, you know, win races and so on they need that well, money because they're all fucking stealing it let right? me yes yeah, michael, so much michael actually let me rephrase that you are correct they want that money yes it's not that they need it it's that they want it and 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 the guys in dc who get rich off this system i mean there's a lot there's billions and billions of dollars every year that wash into dc and there are a lot of these guys who you know who, members of congress who were you know, when they got in there, they'd never had a job making more than a buck fifty a year who go out, you know, suddenly very, very wealthy men and women. And 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 that system rewards their consultants and their and their friends and their lobbyists and them and themselves. And a lot of this is, you know, why was Paul Ryan such a suck up? Because Paul Ryan, you know, had never made a dime in his life. He wanted to go be on the board at Fox when he got out. All mm -hmm. these things. Yeah, you know, Washington is a spectacularly corrupt city. So you're you're correct. They really want they really want that that idea of of you know the corporate America you know world coming to kiss the ring and giving them what they needed. The second big part of this MAGA rules is that you have to pretend that the only way you can get to conservative goals is by making a compromise with evil people. And you have to pretend that there's no other solution. Well, we could never sell America on X or Y, so we're going to have to make a deal with the devil. Whether that devil is Trump, whether that devil is is Mitch McConnell, whether that devil is the is is the election deniers, whether that devil is the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers or Roger Fucking Stone or any of those other things, they've they've convinced themselves they have to make a deal with evil to do good, and they're not doing good. But every time you make a deal with evil, you get fucked. I mean, the story of Dr. Faust was always the, the irony of, of, of all deals with the devil is the devil always breaks the deal. So Kevin McCarthy is making a deal with the devil with Marjorie Taylor Greene and with Trump, and the devil always breaks the deal. So when Kevin, it's a, they win the majority, you know, there's a really good chance because you know this better than any human being on earth, Donald Trump can be sadistic as hell. Yes. And he's thinking about Kevin McCarthy, and, and he's rubbing his hands together thinking, you know what? It, Jim Jordan's been better for me than, than Kevin. Kevin once said bad things about me. So I'm going to stick with Jim. And he's going to go out and truth or tweet or say something to Sean Hannity like, Kevin would be better for me uh, than, if he was gone. And it should be Jim Jordan instead. And you know what? There's a really good chance all those MAGAs in the Congress go, I don't know, I'm not going to cross Trump. Yep. Yeah, well, you're 100% right because he could be sadistic. Uh, and hence, firing people by Twitter so that they find out, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, right. Or on his truths or whatever it might be. So let me ask you this then, because there have been whispers of a Trump indictment post-November 8th. And I have yep. so much to say on this one. That the Justice Department will get more aggressive once it's in the clear of the election, the midterm election. The low-hanging fruit is obviously Trump's handling of classified, or I sure. should say mishandling of classified yeah. documents. Yeah. What have you heard? And what do you think of reports that such an indictment is imminent? You know, Michael, I, I have been around this, been around this, this rodeo now for uh, damn near seven years. And I, I'll believe it when I see it. I would love it. It's justified. It would be, it would be great. I think for the rule of law in this country, but I got to tell you, I've seen the Justice Department pull back from the edge way too many times now to, to make any predictions about it, and and I really wish we had a situation where where I could confidently say, hey, these guys are 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 they're closing in, they're going to do it, because um, I do think the minute the election's over, especially when the Republicans take the House. I think Trump's going to announce pretty quickly. That's my that's my opinion on it. 
that's the rumor down from Mar-a-Lago, the people chatting down there that, you know, he doesn't he doesn't want to wait much longer because the minute he's a, a candidate, the chemistry and the atmosphere of the of the politics of this changes really quickly. And it becomes a lot e easier for the Justice Department to go, well, you know, he's a candidate. We don't want to seem political. And, and, and do I wish he'd be indicted? Yeah, last week, yesterday, last month, from the beginning. I, I'm, I just, I'm a skeptic about it because I've seen him snake out of too many of these things. And I've seen DOJ pull back too many times. I hope they do it. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. But I'm not confident they're going to. Okay, so let's unpack this for a minute or two here. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. First of all, I have a real problem with the fact that Merrick Garland has been sitting on this possible indictment, and it's not just this one regarding these documents. Uh -huh. There's about 20 already yes. that he yes. could have indicted. Yes. There's, there's 20. And now all of a sudden we're getting close to the November 8th date. Oh, I don't want to seem partisan. I don't want to, I don't want to be political in it. How about this one? Fuck you. How about do your fucking job? And I don't care whether it falls out on November 8th that you indict. I don't care if it's November 7th. I don't care if it's today, tomorrow. It makes no difference. If right. you broke the law, and this man has broken the law, he has taken documents that place your life, my life, our yep. family's lives, our listeners' lives, our friends' lives, the entire country's lives in jeopardy. All right? Do we really need a 9-11 in every city and every state in this country because Merrick Garland doesn't have the fucking balls to pull the goddamn trigger. What he's worried about is not about, oh, it's going to seem partisan and it's going to seem political. and so He's worried that he won't get a conviction. And it's the same shit that goes on here in the federal court system. Stop fucking worrying about, like, like even um, Alvin Bragg. Alvin Bragg didn't pursue Trump, not because there wasn't more than enough proof. When you have someone like Mark Pomerantz and Carrie Dunn, right. two exceptional, exceptional lawyers, exceptional, who right. have been on this case for two years telling you, dude, we have them. We have them on tax. We have them on misrepresentation, bank fraud, wire fraud, money laundering, tax evasion. We have them on all of it. And the guy turns around, washes his hands and says, no, nah, you know what? His, you know, his concern, a, his yeah, concern it, it, by the way, Rick, is simply that he would end up putting Trump on the stand and make Trump would probably, of course, take the fifth. And at the end of the day, you know what Trump would do? He would turn around and say, this is all political. And there yep. would be one juror, one that would turn around and hold it up. And that's what they don't want to happen. They don't want I, their I, record I, to be marred. I, I, I got to tell you, <clears throat> on the list of people who have absolutely destroyed their public credibility, Alvin Bragg is at the top of the fucking pyramid. They, I mean, by every description of that case, it was it was rock solid and he walked away. And and I, I do fear, I do fear that the, that the, that, that, that the jury pollution that, that any Trump defense lawyer could try to do is enormous. I think there would be plenty of MAGA voters and potential jurors who would lie and say, I'm neutral, ah, and go in and save their hero. Um, but the DOJ, you know, th they have a scope of ability to, to pursue this and to prosecute this, as you well know, that that for once they should turn their powers to good and go after this guy. Because look, the things he stole, those classified documents, that's not a that's not a small ball political disagreement. Those are real. Those are acute national harm to this country. Amazing that to me that he's not already arrested. I've told this story before. When I was in the first Bush administration as a young man, I had a TS, SCI, all these clearances. And if I had, on my last day of work, loaded up a box full of classified documents and top secret documents and walked out the door, I would be in jail right now still. I would go to prison. You would be, be in Guantanamo. You'd be in Guantanamo yeah, Bay. I would, right. Look at what they under did. Under the prison. I, right. I'd be in Gitmo. There's no way this is anywhere close to, and all this bullshit from Cash Patel and all these little lunatics, he declassified it in his mind like Karnak. No, he didn't. 
That's not how any of this works. Look at what happened to Reality Winner. Five years on one document. All right. Correct. If you want to use that as a and that and what was she doing? She was a whistleblower on something that was that was of national import, and yet she gets five, and he ends up. You know, still sitting there stuffing his fucking face with Mar-a-Lago burgers, you know, running around the country, raising more money off unsuspecting stupids. This is this is not this is not America. I mean, look at Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. What Trump did with these documents. And yep. look, I want you I want you to take a look at something when you're doing your next video, what have you. On August 31 of 2022, right after this whole raid and so on, you know what I turned around and I tweeted out? What the FBI needs to do now is they need to search Trump Tower Fifth Avenue. They need to search Trump National Golf Club in D.C. Eric Trump's home, Don Jr.'s home, Ivanka and Jared's home. How about the one in um, in Bedminster where he was at? Every single place that this guy has gone, you need to draw a map. Everywhere. Everywhere. Anywhere. Because I promise you, knowing him as well as I do... There's more. And, you know, we know that there's more because in those top secret documents, it says onto it like one of eight pages. And there was no pages there. Okay, so then they find out in the box that they seal that's now before the special master, there's two documents. Well, where are the other six? And more importantly, Carolyn Maloney was spot on on this one when she sent the letter to NARA demanding that they send a letter to Trump under the penalties of perjury to acknowledge that he does not have, does not know of where they are, has not shown these documents or anything to anybody. You know, and it's a pretty extensive list. They, they did not send that letter to Donald, from what I understand. So now she's going to do it through the House Oversight Committee while she still sits in the chair. You know, th- this, is, this, is, this idea that Trump is above the law, I know that it thrills the shit out of Trump fans that they think he's above the law. But... And I I know it's hard for them to like process consequences and think about the good of the nation beyond the good of Donald. But if we live in a nation where a president can break the law, we will live in a nation where presidents break the law. And it won't always be the, it won't always be what they want. It won't always be the outcome they think is owning the libs or having fun or or, 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 or helping Donald. It will be outcomes that they don't want. There will be, this is, a, this is a precedent that is profoundly corrosive to the American Republic. This is a precedent that is profoundly corrosive to democratic principles. And, and that I hope the DOJ will keep in mind because if they don't, if they don't, the guy is gonna run again He's not running again. I I I don't know, man. Look, you and I are going to do a dollar bet, a crisp, brand new. You got to go to the bank to get it, dollar bill. He's not running because if he runs, the big grift is over. What he wants is he wants wants the power without being the president. He wants to be like what Putin was when he wasn't president. He wants to be prime minister. He wants to have full access to the White House. He wants to be able to take advantage so that he could monetarily benefit from it. That's really what he's looking for. But I want to jump onto something different for a second. Yeah, yeah. Last, Last week on Pod Save America, former President Barack Obama came out swinging. And he thinks that Democrats can be a bit of a buzzkill, too easily Uh offended, right, over accidental slights and the complicated scenarios of modern life. I'm curious what you think he meant here and your opinion on its validity. Listen, you know, it's a funny day when Barack Obama and I are in a thousand percent agreement on something. But I've said this a lot. I wrote about this God knows how many times. America is not as woke as Democrats think. America is not San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Boston. America is a bigger, messier country than they think. And so when 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 people get, you know, yelled at or canceled or screamed at because they don't use the right pronoun or if they say Latin, if they say Hispanic instead of Latin X or any number of other things, that disconnects the Democratic Party from real working people across this country. The Democrats are at their strongest when they're making an argument that they're helping people in their daily lives. They're, the Democrats are strongest when they're when they're when they're telling a story about how they're going to use government for the good of individuals across this country. 
they're at their weakest when they're lecturing. They're at their weakest when they're when they're wagging a finger in the face of America. And Barack Obama gets that. He understood one of the reasons he was so effective as a politician in this country is he came across as a guy who wasn't unreasonable. He didn't come across as, as a strident progressive hack. He came across as somebody who 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 understood that America had wasn't this homogenous single place and that you know people represented different ideas and different 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 things across the country. And look, people in their lives don't want to be lectured. They work fucking hard every day. I was in a focus group in 16 and it was the moment I knew Trump would win. Had a guy who was a recent guy who just moved to Florida. He had moved to Florida from Pennsylvania and he said, you know, I voted for Obama but I just don't know if I if I say the wrong thing at work, I'm going to lose my job and my pension. If I say the wrong thing, if I say somebody's Latino instead of Hispanic, or if I don't say somebody's gender the right way or don't use a pronoun, I'm going to lose my job. And so I can't deal with that. I can't handle that. I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. He's crazy, but it won't. But I but I won't live in that world anymore where where I'm afraid somebody could snitch on me and get me fired. That snitch shit. And that and that cancel stuff, it is a powerful thing that Democrats do not understand um, that they lose a lot of people. And they're now losing Hispanic and African-American men over it. I saw that. I saw that. Reverend I mean, that shit, talking about that, that is a morning. deadly poison in their party. And you got to have more Connor Lambs and fewer AOCs. And you got to have more, more Val Demings and fewer Cory Bushes if you want that party to effectively hold on to a big part of its base. You know, look, while I agree, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But there's, <laughs> there's always a but here, right? Yeah, yeah. At the, at, the end, at the end of the day, if I was president of the United States, and let's say that there are 10 items, and I'm going to take it from Ed Koch, and I've talked about it on the podcast before. Ed Koch had it right. When he said, if you agree with me, you know, five, you know, if you disagree with, if you agree with me, what did he say? Something like five out of 12 times, you should vote for me. If you agree with me 12 out of 12 times, you should see a psychiatrist. And he's (laughs) right. You and I, who seem to be on similar grounds, we don't agree on all 12 things. As far as I'm concerned, I don't. I personally don't agree with cancel culture. I don't agree. I don't agree that Trump shouldn't be on Twitter. I don't agree that even Ye, who I think has just lost his mind, I don't think that he should be canceled. You know, either. How about this? If you don't like what they're saying, don't support them. Right. Don't listen to this music. Don't vote for Donald. Don't go to his fucking locations. You know, don't buy his shit ties. Whatever it is. If I have a fundamental problem with you, then I just don't want to support you. And if enough people don't support you, you go away. Instead, we're forcing people to go away. And that's just another talking point for Republicans. In fact, right. it's, the, it's the weakness of the DNC that allows this shit to happen. Stop focusing on what the Republicans are saying. You know, gas prices, gas prices. Why don't you focus on the things like we have a 2% unemployment. We have the highest growth rate right in this country right now uh, right. As, far as, as far as jobs and the highest wages that are being paid and blah, blah, blah. Talk about the stuff that makes your life better. And if you think that democracy right, is not worth the price of a dollar or $2 more per gallon of gas. By the way, this is a mistake. If I was Biden, I would have I would have started fracking again. I would have opened that shit up. We have 360 billion barrels of oil in this country, more than Saudi and Iran all combined and Russia combined. Open up the fucking spigot and let's flood the fucking market with it. Pay off our debt of $38 trillion because that's what it's worth, right? Bring the country back to par. By the time we finish using up these 360 billion barrels, there won't be a use for fossil fuels anymore. Everything will be 
battery. Who knows? Maybe it'll be hydro. Who the hell knows what people like an Elon Musk may end up coming or another inc incredible sure. inventor. But this cancel culture, I understand. I have friends of mine, really. I mean, r good, smart guys went to Ivy League schools and didn't have their daddies buy them in. And they turn around and they say, listen, this he, him, they, them, me, this. I'll call you whatever you want me to call you. Whatever you want. You want me to call you, you know, you know, Mrs. Wilson? I'll call you Mrs. Wilson. I don't care. It doesn't mean anything to me. If that's how you want to be called, fine. Let you be you. Let me be me. But maybe yeah. I don't want to be called he, him, they, them. Maybe I just want to be called Michael. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's so, you know, we're my, my, falling, is, Rick, we're falling into the Republican trap and we yes. have to stop it. Yes. Again, Democrats are best when they're talking about how they're going to help people economically. How they're going to lift people up, how they give a shit about people and working people in particular. They're at their worst when when they're scolding people. They're at and their defending. worst when they're when they're being when they're being offended by everything. Yep. Yep. So, so let me then ask you this, because a yeah. CNN panel recently roasted the Republican Party for embracing candidates who, you know, once would have been considered fringe but who are now directly in the party's mainstream. And we brought him up, Herschel Walker, who I think is insane. Amazing football player. I will never take that away from him. But as one far the, as a politician, dude, what, what, what I mean, one greats. of the best. But as far as for a politician, I mean, it's, it's a fucking joke. You know, Michael, and, it's, a you know, lesson, when, it's a lesson that some people believe that, that because they're good at doing one thing, they're good at doing everything. Right. And, and, and it's also a lesson. I mean, Walker in particular, the guy has mental issues and, and brain trauma issues. And, and these people are exploiting this guy in a sick okay, way. Okay, so I look, think, let, let's, let's jump in. So let's jump into him for a second. So Herschel Walker repeatedly threatened to murder his own family and is generally right. seen as a dumpster fire as a candidate. At least that's how I perceive him. Then there are folks like Lauren Boebert, another obviously insane, you know, maggot right um and she's just completely another, insane. She's, a, she's she's another marjorie taylor green how do these folks keep winning and could it truly be possible that half of the electorate has also gone fucking insane what's your thought michael look again redistricting makes insane people electable in 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 red districts and let's be honest it makes some insane people electable in blue districts as well um but redistricting is the is the the cancer eating the political stability of the country alive, um, and that, look there there is a large culture now on the right in particular that is fed by Facebook and Fox and OAN and Newsmax and all these other you know post reality news organizations news, um, and they believe shit that isn't true. They believe it a lot, and and the difficulty with with having that kind of a, a set of beliefs is that once you're in, you're in all the way. Once you're in, you keep diving in further and further and further, it gets worse and worse. And I, and I think that those people live in a world that that they're comfortable with now. And they they love the shit, you know, when Trump says, I won the election by a lot, they just buy it. They just, it's easier to believe that than to think for yourself. Yeah, well, look, there's more to this story than just that. I mean, you have Always. Like, oh, yeah. the influence, you know, you have, for example, the influence of someone like Peter Thiel, right, who made billions um, uh, alongside yeah, we, Elon Musk as part of the, what they used to call them, say, themselves, the PayPal mafia, right? And they're having an effect on this election cycle. I have a real problem with all of this because this is dangerous. Sure. How dangerous do you think, like, this guy's worldview and money, you know, this dark money into politics? Th it's, you know, I've, it's I've heard so, Republicans it's so enraging. It's so enraging that yeah. I actually don't even have an answer for it myself. Well, I'll tell you this, you know, look, we are stuck with um, Citizens United for the time being. And it gives anybody the right to view to, to, to treat their political speech in, as or their money as a form of political speech. And Teal has that right. But I mean, for years, I heard Republicans screaming, oh, my God, George Soros is corrupting yeah, our elections with dark money yeah. and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, Michael, it's um, 
it's a it's a it's a big mountain to climb and and as i always you know use the old phrase you how do you eat an elephant you start at the ass and go forward um we got to just keep eating the elephant here because this is this is a a a discussion and a a political fight we're going to face for a long time of how money has reshaped american politics so yeah there's a great book i read it while i was in otisville called dark money you know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. it's 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 true. I mean, yeah, for sure. When you when you're when you're upset because Donald violates rules, which he does every day, and you know he starts uh, you know stoking these fires that are dangerous, and you get Twitter as an example that bans him, right? Yeah. Or like what Ye was doing. Now all of a sudden you get Elon Musk, right, who turns around takes his money. He's look, it's his money. He could buy whatever the hell he wants. But you're Correct. buying it so that you could put these people back on because you think that it's a violation of their First Amendment right? You want to talk about somebody who had a violation of their First Amendment right, Elon? How about, why don't you come have a conversation with me about what it's like to be thrown into prison, into solitary confinement for 51 days because the President of the United States didn't want you publishing a book, right? So they lure you down there. And I look, I talk about this in my book, Revenge. By the way, yeah. I just got a call this morning, interestingly enough, on my book, Revenge, uh-huh. Number eight on the New York Times bestseller. Get it. So Get on listen, it. enough. Uh, and and it. what this does, what I hope that this does is because I wrote it as a roadmap so that people could understand that Americans, both Republican, Democrat, independent, whatever, will understand what it's like to go through the process. And the ultimate goal of this lunatic Donald is to become an autocrat. He wants to be Kim Jong-un. He wants to be Vladimir Putin. And what I do is I lay out the playbook on what he did and what he will do again. By the way, Rick, you're not safe if this guy wins. You know, you're on his enemies list. All of us are. Which brings me to my next question for you. If there's a MAGA victory, can we expect to see an uptick in extremist violence? And how do you think that that will manifest? Look, there's a big, um, there's a big, dark tendency now inside the the right that they showed us on January sixth what they'll do. They showed us they'll 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 come hard against every institution in the country that they disagree with, and you know I've spent a long time now on that list, and 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 I have I have security, I have to, I have people show up at my house, I've had people chase me around in their cars, I've had people confront me in public, uh, you know. Uh, I've had people go after my kids. I don't tolerate it. I don't put up with it. Um, but it's going to spread and it's going to get worse. And if you end up in a country where the rule of law has fallen apart and and people who do evil on behalf of the president get pardons, well, then you don't have a country with a rule of law anymore. So I, I am uh, it, it, I don't just fight this guy for 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 you know my own purposes, but I certainly recognize that that if there's a big MAGA victory and if he's back in 24 by whatever circumstance, it's not a good world. So it's, it's a dangerous place. So, well, Michael, listen, thank you for having me, brother. I appreciate it. I need you. I need you for about another two questions here. Okay. 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 Right. I'm going to keep you. You yeah. know, we spoke about, we spoke about Matt Gates before for yes. a moment. You know, obviously I have a real issue with him for what he did, despite the fact that Sean Hannity got him to apologize and one of the I think I've yeah. even posted the apology. Can you please explain to me how the hell did Matt Gates wiggle out of the noose? Or or is he not fully out of the woods yet? I I think that leak came from Matt Gates's legal team. I don't know that he's fully out of the noose. I, I think their team leaked that or they were trying to, to set that up. I don't think he's fully out of the noose yet. That case is still ongoing and uh We'll see how that breaks. I, I, Can you I, do me a favor? I will say because this. you know this, you know this better than most. Where are they at this? It's over two years since this guy Rosenberg. Once again, this, um, this is one of those things in politics now where the judicial branch and and the prosecutorial folks in this in, in, in various state and federal agencies they need to stop being afraid of political consequences. What's the and political I, and I, process? Listen, I've, known Matt Gates, I've known Matt Gates since he was like 25 years old or maybe earlier when he was in the state house. This guy will keep doing what he's been doing because he thinks he's going to get away with it. Um, it, it will not stop. I, I get it. I get it. But here, 
as a prosecutor on that case, you got the check, you yep. have the emails, you yep. have the witness. Now they're saying, oh, the witness yep. may not be credible. Who gives a shit about the credibility of him? You got right. the check, you got the girl, she's Indict underage. Him it's and over. take him to trial. I mean, this is Two not a plus hard case years. in my view. Rick, do you understand as I write in my book, Revenge, my entire case started and ended in 48 hours. Am I any different than Matt Gates? I didn't do anything. They shoved the shit up my ass. Instead, this guy, this guy paid underage girls to travel over state lines. It's transportation right. of a minor you, for the purpose of- I mean, it, it, it is every, it is a textbook man act case. It, 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 if this was a random asshole that they caught doing this, he would be in prison already. He would if be. This was some random, random guy who did this with, with an underage girl. He would be in prison already. Well, I have a look. I have one last question for you. Okay. And this, of course, pertains to Project Lincoln. All right. Yep. Because like any time you and I get into it, first of all, my blood pressure is up. Second of all, <laughs> the hour is almost up. Right. So look, Steve Schmidt recently had some ugly things to say about Project Lincoln in light of the recent Showtime documentary about the organization accusing it of, and I'm going to quote, some of the most despicable and unethical behavior I've ever seen. Well, I don't know what he's watching, but among other things, he demands the removal of Reed Galen, who I've had on this show, uh, and I was just on his show, from the organization who he calls selfish and dishonest, and wants Project Lincoln taken down to the studs. How do you respond to Schmidt, and how do you feel about his demands? Um... Steve is no longer with the Lincoln Project for a variety of reasons, and and in the in the remaining days of this election cycle, I'm going to focus on on doing what the Lincoln Project does. The Lincoln Project has has grown. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons about managing the Lincoln Project in the last uh, two years, and Steve's departure um, is one that you know we'll comment on at the appropriate time and place. And we'll make clear on certain fact basis uh, items and, and fact matters um, at the appropriate time and place. But in the meantime, we are really, really laser focused in on the economy, uh, on the on, on the economy's role in this election, on how we're going to make you know break the Republican stride, and that's where we're focused. And I'm not on not on uh, you know trying to 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 set some sort of narrative about where the Lincoln Project's been and where we're going. But what's what's his what's his beef with Reed? I mean, I've spoken to Reed at least a dozen times. I, I don't find him to be dishonest. I don't find him to be unethical. You know, you maybe if you don't like, you know, the content being put out, like I said before, when I was talking about cancel culture, don't watch it. It's that simple. You know, Reed, Reed is one of my closest friends and, and, and a guy who has held this organization together when, when the storms and the winds were battering it. Um, and has led us uh, and led this team very, very ably. Um, and he's a guy who who I have the utmost respect for. And you know, again, we'll speak to we'll speak to the uh, to Steve's comments at some later date. But again, we're like, we're like so locked up on this election cycle right now uh, in these key races that we don't have time to 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 go back and 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 settle old beefs for whatever reason they exist. So we're we're, we're gonna look. we'll 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 comment at the appropriate time and place. But again, I gotta I got thirty ads to make in the next twenty days, so it's uh it's yeah. a little bit. I got do me a favor, real please. Stuff. Stay and stay in touch because, like Absolutely. you, we have a pretty decent sized platform. The the mayor Absolutely. movement is growing. I mean, we're like top thirty now podcast news out there. Love I'm it. so thankful to all of my listeners for joining this movement with me, with you, uh, Lincoln Project, with Midas uh, Touch, with you know so many of the groups. My goal here, like yours, is I want to open up people's eyes to understand that this isn't about whether you have a Republican or a Democrat as governor, as senator, as you know, as a member of Congress or whatnot or even the presidency. It's about the country. It's about having a person who wants to benefit, not himself and his brand, which is what Trump ran on, but rather to benefit the country. Because 
We're losing our democracy. And too many of these people are too blinded by the bullshit rhetoric, the hatred, the divisiveness that's going on yeah. to focus upon what's really important. And that's leaving a democracy for our children. I don't understand how that could even be in Right, it's like, right why now. is this even a question? Yes, why? Well, I, I gotta tell you, Michael, it is, it, it, we, this country, we're at a really deep inflection point right now in the country, and we're going to make a decision as a as a as a country and a culture where this where we're going to go. And you know, it's incumbent upon all folks like us who we may not agree on everything politically, but we agree that a, a that, that this republic can't stand if it's not a representative democracy, and it can't survive if it's an autocracy. And I, that's the core of the fight for me, at least at this point. And uh, you know, I think we're just going to have to keep pushing forward from there. As it is for me, and I thank you as always, Rick. Stay thank in you, touch. brother. I'll I will talk stay to you in soon. touch with you. You Great. got it. Thanks, Be well, my friend. You too.